Hi, I'm Jim Zogby and welcome to Viewpoint. It's been a year since the Saudi-led coalition began launching airstrikes on Yemen in retaliation, they said, for Yemen's president being ousted from power. Joining me now to discuss the status of the conflict is Barbara Bodine, a distinguished professor in the practice of diplomacy and director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. During her 30-plus years in foreign service, she focused primarily on the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf countries, served as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Yemen from 1997 to 2001. Thank you. My pleasure. Nice to see you um, again. So it's been a year yes. since the Saudis uh, began their uh, attacks on, on, on Yemen. Mm -hmm. To restore President Hadi to power, here's what I want to do. Um, <laughs> I want to look at where we are. There's a New York Times headline, which right. I'm going to put up on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and hinting that, as I said, let's put it up on the screen so we can take a look at it, um, that says, hints of an end to the fighting in Yemen. And then it goes on to describe yeah. the, the it. I want to talk about where we are right now. Then I want to go back for mm -hmm. our viewers who don't know the history or where sure. we are. And then I want to go forward to okay. see what can actually come of, of all of this. First, with regard to the, the hints of, of, right. a, of, a, of an end to the fighting, um, there are some very specific timetables mentioned here. A ceasefire on the 10th of April mm -hmm. and the 18th negotiations begin apparently in Kuwait. Kuwait. Um, are, are you optimistic or are you just ho-hum about this? <laughs> um, this is the first positive sign that we've mm -hmm. seen uh, just before the announcement uh, by the UN of the ceasefire and then the talks in Kuwait. There was a mini agreement um, between Saudi Arabia and Houthi negotiators uh, just along the border with Sada, just between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very limited ceasefire in terms of geography. It included a prisoner swap, which is kind of confidence building measures 101, um, and a rather odd Facebook statement by one of the Houthi leaders asking Iran to no longer meddle in Iran, in sorry, Yemeni affairs. And that was kind of our first hint uh, because the Saudi Sada border is the most critical to the Saudis. Uh, and a prisoner swap is always a good sign. It was followed relatively shortly thereafter by this announcement of a broader ceasefire and mm -hmm. broader talks in Kuwait. And so those of us who, who have been watching this, this is the closest thing to something positive. The previous ceasefires were almost imposed by the UN and they were always driven by the humanitarian crisis and they never held. Uh, this one seems to have more politics behind it. It seems to have the Saudis behind it, and it seems to have the Houthis, and probably by extension the Iranians behind it. One other very recent development that uh, I'd like you to come on before we go backwards sure. yeah. um, is the announcement that came from President Hadi Yesterday. of deposing his yes. vice president and replacing him with General uh, Ali, Ali Mohsen al Ahmad. Um, the, several ways of looking at that. One <laughs> of them is that um, it was a Saudi slap at the Emirates, um, mm -hmm. but also that it's because, uh, for reasons that maybe you can tell yeah. us about. The other is that, um, well, was it a smart move? Tell, tell me that. Was this a smart move, and, and, uh, and is it, uh, does it spell something positive for the future, or do you think that it's going to be a, 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 a problem in the negotiations? Because he is a very hard line on the Houthi. Right. Yeah. It's, um, I didn't see this as a positive step. Okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, President Hadi brought Ali Mohsen back into the government as kind of political advisor, minister of defense, and that was a very disturbing development because, as you said, Ali, Ali Mosin is extremely hardline. Uh, he is the one who led the military campaign under Saleh to try to defeat the Houthi. I would point out that he was not successful. Um, and so was this an, uh, an effort to 
kind of bring Ali Mosin and those military units that are still loyal to him more on the fight for Hadi? Okay, I can almost understand that. Um, this dismissal of Baha is... The current the, Prime Minister, Vice President. The current Prime Minister, Vice President, or at least up until yesterday, uh, is disturbing because he, bring, he brought in Ali Mosin not only as Vice President, but he brought in somebody who, to be honest, very few people have ever heard of, uh, to be the Prime Minister. So he, he took those two jobs and he split them. Um, and the new Prime Minister is a member of the, the main party, the, the General People's Congress, Ali Abdullah's party, but a very hardliner. So he's brought in two very heavy part hardliners. One is a politician of no particular note. Uh, the other is a, a general of no particular military um, victories, uh, but both politically very hardliner. And more importantly, Khalid Baha um, was a technocrat, or is a very well-respected technocrat. Uh, he is not from the north or the south. He's from the Hadra Mount, so it made him kind of a neutral party. Uh, he had been brought in as prime minister under Houthi pressure a year and a half ago uh, when the Houthis came into Sana'a. So he had connections with the Houthi. He was acceptable to Hadi. He was from the Hadra Mount, the three H's. And so there was a lot of, of, of expectation that he was going to be a bridge to the next government. It may be that Hadi also saw that he was a bridge to the next government as the vice president. The Yemeni constitution allows the vice president to take the place of the president, which is how Hadi came to power. So is this Hadi just trying to neutralize a successor? Or is this Hadi signaling a very hard line? Um, Baha was known to be more sympathetic to coming up with a political solution. He had connections with the Houthi. There are reports that the Saudis actually would like to get to a political accommodation. Mm -hmm. And this Sada border pre-agreement kind of signaled that. And so is, is, how does this fit in with the yeah. Saudi? Yeah. Um, and we also know that the Emiratis very much would like a political solution. And they're close to Baha. And they're close to Baha, but so, is, so are the Saudis. Yeah. Um, and as a, as a Hadrami from the Hadramount, he was neutral in terms of this yeah. north-south Let's business. just do, do the following. Let's, it, it's, <laughs> it's really difficult to go yeah. back because... Um, Where do you go back there to? Are, there are conflicts within conflicts Conflict. within conflicts. It's difficult to sort of f peel off the layers of the onion. Right. But if we start with the Arab Spring, okay. um, with the beginning of turmoil in the country um, through as a way to resolve some of the conflict, the Gulf countries coming in and right. creating a compromise that brought Hadi to power in the first place. Right. Take us from there to the beginning of the conflict and how we got to here. Right. Um, in the beginning, it looked as if, I mean, Yemen did fall into the, the protests and the demonstrations mm -hmm. of the Arab Spring. But unlike some other countries, um, they actually negotiated a settlement. Uh, they negotiated uh, Ali Abdullah out of power. They negotiated Hadi coming in. Uh, the GCC agreement allowed all of that to happen. And there was some thought that Yemen was going to make it through make the Arab yeah. Spring. The, most the one thing I would just to Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, was ousted from power right. at that point but stayed around. Right. And he reminded me of the Seinfeld episode with George Costanza, <laughs> yes. where he gets fired and keeps coming back to, to work. Yeah, there is a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, the immunity that was given to him was probably necessary for the yeah. transition. Whether or not him staying around was a good idea, people are wondering about. I think it's also important to note that at one point, he, after his mosque was blown up and several of the members of his cabinet were killed. Uh, he was um, in medical treatment in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and there was a question about whether or not he would go back to Yemen. And there were people who advised the Saudis to keep him in Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis actually allowed him to go back. And I 
my guess is they deeply regret that. Um, Sala is one of the best politicians I've ever met, and it was the idea that you could depose him and he would quietly sit at his house was probably naive. So we have the GCC agreement, we get Sala out, we get Hadi in. Um, the most significant step was the convening of the National Dialogue Conference. And it was the first one under the Arab Spring. It was remarkably diverse in terms of every component of this incredibly complex country had a seat at the table. Uh, women, youth, Southerners, Houthis were there. Everybody except Al-Qaeda was, was present. And they fought through and talked through, as Yemenis can do, basically a new social contract. And again, there was a great deal of hope. Where it broke down was, first of all, they came up with a federal system that sort of nobody liked. Everyone liked federalism, nobody liked the lines. More importantly, even though everyone had been involved in the national dialogue and involved in this new social contract, the GCC agreement actually stipulated that all this notwithstanding, the new political structure would be based on the two previous political parties, the General People's Congress, Salah's party, and something called the Joint Meeting Party, which was this bizarre amalgam of ISLA, which was in itself an amalgam of northern tribes and mother Muslim brotherhoods, mother Muslim brotherhood, so over here, and the Yemen Socialist Party over here. And basically, by defaulting back to the two pre-existing political parties, you negated the role, the effort, the participation of women, of youth, of Houthis, of Southerners, and there was a bit of this, why did we do this? Mm -hmm. And I think what really fueled the Houthis coming into Sana'a a year later, um, when the transition had stalled and there were no elections, was we did everything right. We were part of Change Square, we were part of the National Dialogue, as were all these other subgroups, and now we're being told that we basically are going back to 2011. We want this process opened up. And you had the National Partnership Plan, maybe might have worked, and then it started to fall apart. And the Houthis, who don't have a governing philosophy or a governing plan or governing experience, were slowly trying to take over the government. January, Baha and Hadi under house arrest. February, they independently managed to get to Aden. And then the Houthis, in a sense, drove south very quickly. I think in some ways the Houthis getting into Aden was a bit like the dog catching the mail truck. Uh, they never thought they would move that far that fast. And all of a sudden the Saudis realized that the Houthis had basically the, the whole country. But the other very critical piece of this. But it this. wasn't the Houthis alone. The Houthis are northern tribes that have. Mm, okay. They're, they're mostly, in, they were mostly they're northerners. In the north. They're right. not a tribe. They're in the north and they had moved south, but they also had Gen President Saleh, the former President right. Saleh's, the forces that were allied with him right. also fighting with them. So it wasn't just a, it wasn't a, just a, a band of insurrectionists. Right. It was an insurrectionist with a large chunk of the old army. Right which is a very mm. odd combination if you remember yeah. that Sala spent 10 years fighting Try, trying to them, kill them trying yeah. to kill them and they trying to kill him yeah. and all of a sudden these two are together and they're pushing south yeah. um, for their own particular reasons not liking the haughty government the other big piece though is in the middle of all of this at the time haughty and baha were under house arrest king abdallah died mm -hmm. And I do remember being with some people who, you know, we were talking about Yemen when it happened and going, this is the very worst time for King Abdullah to die. We then had a Saudi succession. We had King Salman come in, who's much more hard line than Abdullah. Um, and then soon his son is brought in as the deputy crown prince. This 30 year old with no military experience becomes a defense minister. 
And that's when the Saudis decided um, that they, you know, they weren't going to stand for this and you had this military engagement. The other piece of this very complex puzzle um, is the U.S.-Iranian nuclear deal. And mm -hmm. President Obama, when he announced it in the Rose Garden, said, you know, we have guaranteed to the Saudis, you know, their security and we will be there for them. Well, the Saudis basically came to us and said, this is our ma major security concern. We're going in. Are you with us or against us? Mm -hmm. And so you had this witch's brew of what probably would have been a civil war anyway. Um, I don't want to sort of say the Saudis are fully responsible for the violence. It was a civil war that probably would have worked itself out in Yemen. The Saudis coming in with major airstrikes, major military, um, completely shifted uh, the topography of this conflict and changed it in a way that now it's an international issue on how you walk it back. The Iranians didn't help um, by making some claims that we, we now have uh, our people, said uh, yeah. the, the head of the Al Quds uh, Brigade, right. we now have our people in four capitals uh, right. Beirut, Sana'a, uh, Damascus, right. and, and, and Baghdad. And, Absolutely. Um, that got the Saudis nervous. And they have. They give their reasons for going in that, number one, they felt betrayed by the U.S., that the U.S., and as they put it, I asked right. uh, uh, a, 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 another guest about this question once, and that was, um, they said the, the U.S. is reconciling with Iran right. and betraying us and leaving us out. Right. That was insecurity. And then there right. was this sense that the Iranians are, are using Yemen as the southern a way that threatens the Saudis from the south right. when they're already being threatened from the north in Syria and Iraq. How, play that out. Is that is that a legitimate concern? Number one, that they've been abandoned by the U.S., and number two, that the Iranians are threatening them from all sides. Yeah. First, um, <clears throat> there is some legitimacy, but I think it's overwrought. Um, I don't think the United States is abandoning Saudi Arabia. I don't think the United States is abandoning the Gulf. Um, you know, to quote uh, another one of your guests, you know, this is, it's not a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have worked with both the Saudis and the Iranians going all the way back to the twin pillar program of the 70s. Uh, so this idea that, you know, we are fully integrating Iran into, you know, our relationships is overstated. The idea that we're abandoning the Saudis is grotesquely overstated. Um, I think have we handled it well? I think we have handled it as well as we could. Okay. We have repeatedly assured them we had a summit here. We are continuing to provide them military equipment. We have done everything. The Saudis, I think, um, their real concern is, is not so much that we abandon them, but that they are being, a, a, they have a real competitor in Iran, not military but a political competitor. The Saudi legitimacy is, is rooted in their role as the custodian of the two holy places, and that they are basically the arbiters of what is a good Islamic government. Um, the Iranians have an alternative model, and it's one that actually has not caught on in the Middle East. But anything that makes it look as if Iran is an alternative model to what a good Islamic government can be is a deep, deep threat to them. So this is a political threat. Um, the theology is secondary. The ethnicity yeah. is secondary. This is politics. The Iranians understand that. Um, they are not responsible for the Houthis. The Houthi is our, you know, the technical academic term is a non-kinship affinity group, which means it's a bunch of guys who got together who aren't related. Um, the, we're not dependent on Iranian arms, dependent on Iranian assistance or anything else. The Iranians have played this. Um, it, it suits them politically. To the, what is really important to Iran is Baghdad, Damascus, and Beirut, not Yemen. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that the Saudis obsess over Yemen and are throwing 
in excess of a billion dollars a month in terms of military equipment, uh, focusing their political and military bandwidth on Yemen, uh, roiling their own domestic politics over Yemen, they're not focused up north. And so if I was an Iranian, I would be delighted that the Saudis are focused on Yemen because anything that's flying south is not flying north. Right. Let's look at the impact of this uh, uh, Saudi involvement. It's, uh, it has been, it's been felt on many levels. There's a political impact, and there's also a humanitarian yes. crisis. Let's look, we have some numbers to put up about the humanitarian crisis, and it's, yeah. it's really quite, uh, quite devastating. Let's take yeah. a look at them. The, the number of people killed, and, I, and in particular, the, the issue, the impact of children and yes. malnutrition and lack of water, um, yeah. it's, it's astounding. It's staggering. Um, and Yemen was a poor country to start with. Well, and I think that's an important point, is that, you know, if 2010 was a heyday, it was a heyday of a country that was already food insecure, water insecure, fuel insecure, medical insecure. It was on the edge. And what's happened in this last year is that it's just been pushed over the edge. Uh, there was no cushion there whatsoever. Um, the, it's been declared a level three humanitarian crisis. There's only four of those in the world. This is not something you aspire to. Um, the devastation of the physical damage, infrastructure damage, and Yemen's infrastructure was fairly rudimentary, is by one estimate, there is as much damage to Yemen in this one year as Syria has suffered in four or five years. The impact on the children is particularly uh, uh, telling um, because, okay, they've missed a year of school. You can, catch, you can catch up on that. But if you are malnourished, that affects your physical growth and your cognitive growth. Um, if you're not getting your um, uh, immunizations, um, you know, all, everything, this, these children are being permanently physically and intellectually stunted, as well as the death rate has gone up considerably. You have dengue fever, which you never had before. You have malaria. Um, children, the major... Uh, cause of infant mortality in Yemen in what was passed for the good old days were diarrheal, water borne. Well, the water system, to the extent that it existed, has been completely destroyed. So you're talking about, you know, I think the 900 children killed is probably a very low number, but the long-term impact is, is going to be something that's going to live with Yemen for a generation. The question is, even if there's a deal, Right. Um, I remember at the end of the, the Lebanon war. Right. There was a Rafiq Hariri. Right. Who, um, who's going to be the Hariri for Yemen? And it, it, it's a country that, as you noted, yeah. uh, just remarkable historical sites. Yes. But, you know, no infrastructure to speak of. Right. Um, what was missing is now destroyed. Right. Um, how does Yemen come back? Yeah. And what does it come back to? Well, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question and one that a lot of us are wrestling with. I would note that um, there has been an enormous amount of damage to the historical sites. Uh, the old city, um, any number of, of, you know, World Heritage UNESCO sites have been destroyed. And you can't put a value on that and you can't actually rebuild them. You can reconstruct them. Um, it, the reconstruction of Yemen is estimated to be about $100 billion. Mm. Uh, and there are no Rafiq Hariris uh, in Yemen. Uh, it's going to take, there are a, a number of major business families in Saudi Arabia who trace their roots to Yemen. The most notorious, of course, are the bin Ladens, um, or at least one bin Laden. Um, <coughs> Would some and the of the Moody's? Yes. There's a lot no, of yeah. I mean, th th there's one bad bin Laden, right. but there's right, right, the right. bin Laden. There's a whole range yeah. of very prominent, very wealthy Yemen origin Saudi families which may decide to step up. Um, 
it's going to take the entire inter international community to at least get in there. And it first, the first is to get the transportation system, the road network going, is if you're isolated, whatever else you bring in is moot, and to get the electricity up. Because without electricity, you can't do water, you can't do health, you can't mm -hmm. do anything else. So that's going to have to be the, the, the first focus, um, as well as just getting humanitarian supplies in. But um, Lebanon's population is 7 million? No, three and a half, four. Three and a half, okay. Yemen's population is about almost 30 million. Yeah. So you're talking about a far more rugged country, far more inaccessible. Most of Lebanon is close to the coast. This is going to be f far, far more difficult. Let me ask a couple questions because we're running out of time, but I do want to talk about other impacts. There is an impact on the social fabric of Yemen. Absolutely. I want to talk about that. I also want to talk about something that we don't talk about, and that is the impact this has had on Saudi Arabia's regional standing. Mm -hmm. and the passivity of the United States, the impact that that's had on us as well yes. in terms of perceptions in the region that we were a coat holder essentially right. Uh, right. in this. If I could ask you quickly to just comment on all three. Oh, well, um, in terms of the social fabric. The social fabric, the social fabric is... I mean, can they achieve a national dialogue at this point or is, is too much water under the bridge? I think, I think that, that everyone's <clears throat> hope is that if we can stop this war soon that you know if it's a year a little bit more than a year there's if you want muscle memory um, people who are involved in the national dialogue are still around you know can you get this back together and Lebanon reweaving itself after 15 years I think is a mm -hmm. is a optimistic point the damage to the social fabric is very worrisome hopefully in a year we can there's enough time to put it back together again go back to the national dialogue as the start point and work forward from there. Don't go back to the GCC, go back to the national dialogue. The cost to Saudi Arabia has, has been enormous, financial, um, regional, and I think particularly when this war is over and people can go in and see what happened, there are going to be a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions about the Saudis having violated any number of the laws of war in terms of blocking harbors, using humanitarian assistance as a weapon, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is very worrisome. And I think the Saudis will have to account for that. Um, our role as coat holders is in the region, we talk about it as the Saudi coalition. In the region it's called the Saudi American coalition and I think we will pay the price for that. There's one other um, ramification of this is while you've had this circular firing squad going on, you know, with any number of players, the one player that has come out of this very strong and gaining territory is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian mm -hmm. Peninsula. This is fundamentally not in our interest, not in Saudi Arabia's interest, not in anybody's interest. But as long as this conflict goes on, AQAP has been able to take territory. It has a major port, McCullough. It has most of the coastline all the way to Aden. It has been fighting in Taiz on the side of the Saudis and President Hadi. And if we, this has allowed what we consider one of the more dangerous elements of Al Qaeda to get a territorial position far in excess of what they've ever had. So. I can't tell you on any level why this war makes sense or why it's going to come out well. The only real hope is to go back to hopefully we will have a ceasefire and hopefully we will start a political process. Thank you so much. We're out of time, but it was a Thank you. It's an important discussion we don't talk about enough. It's a yeah. sort of a, a war that's off the front pages and so it we, is. Don't, we don't talk about it. Yes. But that's all the time we've got for information. You can follow us on Twitter at AAIUSA or check out our website at aaiusa.org. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.